When playing D&D, how do you make your character feel unique? Look, here's the fact of the matter. When you make a character and you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, you are making a character for the most popular role-playing game that there is. Already you're at a disadvantage when it comes to uniqueness, right? And then you have to consider the fact that there are only 12, 13 if you include the Artificer, classes that you could choose from. And those are classes that every single person who plays D&D chooses from. Then you consider the widespread appeal of D&D, I mean, honestly, when it comes to content creation, D&D is king, and you realize that it becomes very, very difficult to create a character who you feel stands out and isn't a carbon copy of thousands of other characters that were created out there. I mean, we have memes that literally identify as this. How many times have we seen a bland fighter, or an edgy rogue, or a horny bard? I don't subscribe to those memes, I don't think they're necessarily as prevalent as people think they are, but humans see things and create patterns based off of common knowledge. These things happen. Those stereotypes didn't come from nowhere. So how do you create a unique character? And why does it matter to create a unique character in the first place? Well, congratulations, we've stumbled upon the topic of today's video. I know, shocking considering the title and the thumbnail. Nonetheless, I want to talk about what it looks like to create a unique character and why that matters. So let's talk about that. Now, before I get to creating a new character, let's talk about why it matters, because I think it's very important. When we play Dungeons & Dragons, we are playing to create a unique story. We don't want to see things that we expect, we want to be shocked, surprised, amazed even. We want to walk away from a session saying, no way, I have no clue how that happened, I never expected that to occur. But it also has to be the right kind of surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise that came out of nowhere. It should be a surprise that we expect, right? Eh, I mean, that kind of makes sense, but at the same time, if it's expected, is it really a surprise? Look, the fact of the matter is, when creating a story, it is important to have a surprise that people could have predicted, but didn't necessarily. For example, plot twists. Everybody loves a good plot twist, right? One of my best experiences with a plot twist ever was in the movie Now You See Me. At the end of the movie, and spoilers for Now You See Me if you haven't seen it or if you care at all, but at the end of the movie, it's revealed that the main agent who has been trying to track down these magicians is actually the mastermind around the whole thing. The first time I watched this movie, blew my mind. Loved it. Literally sat there gasping, going, oh my lord, I never saw that coming. It was awesome. I enjoyed it. Until I started to think. I started to think about literally any of the decisions this character had made. All of the things that had happened. And it slowly began to become very clear that it made absolutely no sense that he was the mastermind behind things. It almost felt like a decision that was made at the end of the movie making process rather than the beginning of the writing process. And so rather than be amazed and awesome and wow this is my favorite movie of all time, slowly I became disillusioned with it because it didn't make sense. Now it would have been another thing if I had been amazed by the plot twist and thought back about everything that occurred and went yep it all adds up but it didn't add up and that's the problem. A surprise, a twist, anything that causes subverted expectations must feel like it was earned, like it made sense. If it surprises you for the sake of a surprise, it doesn't feel very impactful at all, now does it? And ultimately, to be 100% honest with you, that's very true in D&D too. We all want to be surprised, we want to walk away from a session going, oh that was amazing, I never saw it coming. Whether that's for a plot twist, a character decision, what have you. But we want to be able to do that because it made sense. It surprised us, yes but it surprised us in the moment, not in retrospective. Nothing could be worse of a surprise than looking back and realizing it just didn't make sense. Of course it surprised you because there was literally no way it could have made sense. So, okay, we've got that set. That's what makes a surprise good. But what does that have to do with creating a unique character exactly? Well, in order to create a unique character, it has to surprise you from what you expect. It's unique because it's not what everything else is. However, you have a very limited amount of things in a mechanical sense. You have 12 to 13 classes, your subclass, and your race. And don't get me wrong, that creates an amazing multitude of different options, but at the end of the day, D&D is based very heavily around the mechanics of your class. And so even if you try to create the most out there character possible, it's really easy to realize that other people have just played this character. I'll go back to the first Barbarian I ever played. I really wanted the Barbarian to be a kind soul because I thought that that's, I don't know, different than what most Barbarians were. Little did I know that most Barbarian players had the same thought. What if the Barbarian wasn't a rage monster 24-7 but instead was a kind soul and the rage was just something else? I mean, heck, just look at Grog from Critical Role and he kind of exemplifies that. 
And you know what? It felt bad. It felt bad to look at all those other Barbarian players and realize that I hadn't created anything that stood out from a crowd, despite the fact that there was no audience for my game. And that's what it comes down to. When we create these stories, we really want to feel like our character is something special, means something, did something different. It's just natural to human desire, I guess. But you know, now that we're around five minutes into the video, how do you do that? How do you create a unique character? This is where all that talk on subverting expectations comes from. When you subvert an expectation of a class, a mechanic, a concept, it has to make sense, but still be surprising. For example, how many times have we seen a rogue that's super edgy and is super talented and skilled because they had to and they had no other choice. They grew up on the streets and they did what they had to to survive. That is what is expected. But let's take another subclass, say the Phantom Rogue. Now see, the Phantom Rogue has the ability to learn skills from the dead, to commune with them and to understand. Take it a step further, and you can say that the reason that the rogue has proficiency has these skills is not because they know any of this stuff. In fact, they could be just some commoner, but they realize that they have the ability to commune with the dead, and the dead can teach them these things. The dead can help them. They can temporarily possess their body in order to be able to help them achieve these goals. Suddenly, mechanically, you have the rogue. The rogue still does the same things but you've subverted the expectations of why the rogue does those things. And that's where I think creating a unique character is key. And don't get me wrong, I'm probably focusing a little bit too much on the class. The class is only a part of your character. But in my experience, the class is where a lot of people start. Whether you like it or not, it's the most important part of the game mechanically for your character. No, the class does not mean who your character is, not even slightly. You still have your personality, your race, your upbringing, your ideals, your flaws, your bonds. But when it gets to rolling dice, yeah, you are your class. And rolling dice is a very large portion of the game. So figuring out how to subvert expectations with your class is the first step to creating a unique character. See why I spent all that time talking about plot twists in the beginning? I told you to come back. Hi, Jay from the future here. I have gone through and I have edited and I realized I did not tell you it would come in in the future. I apologize, but the statement still stands. So this naturally leads to the conclusion of how do you actually subvert those expectations with your class? I mean, sure, you did that with Phantom Rogue, but that's what the Phantom Rogue is. Their class mechanics literally lead to already learning things from the dead, so that was an easy little jump. But how do you do that with each of the classes? For me at least, you don't look at what the class is supposed to be. You only look at the mechanics. And to prove my point, I'm going to do a little bit of an exercise right here in front of you. You see, what I have here is an online die roller. Now ignore that first roll, but I'm going to go ahead and roll. And based off the 1 through 12, I'm going to select a class from D&D Beyond. To make things fair, if I roll a 12, I will roll twice to see which of the last two I get, in case I might get Artificer. But here we go. Alright, we got ourselves a 6. Let's go check what that is. Alright, let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, Monk. We're gonna go with Monk. Now currently right here we have 10 subclasses for Monk, so I'm going to go ahead and roll a d10 and we'll see where we get from there. Okay, we got ourselves a 9. So going down from here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Way of the open hand. Can't be any more traditional than that. So, we have ourselves a Monk, way of the open hand. How would I make that off type? How would I make that unique? In fact, it's going to be a little difficult, because the fact of the matter is, Way of the Open Hand is one of the subclasses that is in the player's handbook. It's just one of the ones you get when you play the game, so statistically, there's going to be a lot of monks out there playing this. Being unique is going to be difficult, so I'm kind of happy with these results. So how would I make this unique? And to be honest with you, I'm sitting here right now spitballing on the mic. There is no script in front of me. This is just my initial thoughts. So hopefully this can help in sort of helping you see my thought process. When you look at the open hand subclass, you get a few things. One, they have a few more abilities when they use their offhand attack. They have the ability to heal themselves. They can eventually cast a sanctuary spell on themselves, which allows other people to have a harder time hitting them. And lastly, they get the quivering palm feature, the ability to hit somebody and then basically create vibrations in their body which can seriously damage them later down the line, if not outright kill them. So really they kind of feel like your generic, very powerful martial arts character from an anime. How do you make this unique? Well, from my thought process, you have two options. You either seriously lean into it or you come up with something totally new. Let's start with the first part. 
Open hand technique. Starting when you choose this tradition at third level, you can manipulate your enemy's key when you harness your own. Whenever you hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by your flurry of blows, you can impose one of the following effects on the target. It must succeed on a dexterity saving throw, be knock prone. It must make a strength saving throw. If it fails, it can be pushed up to 15 feet away from you, and it can't take reactions until the end of your next turn. So if I were to totally lean into the fantasy of the open hand monk in order to create a unique character, what would I do? Well, it says you can manipulate your enemy's key when you harness your own every time you hit them with a flurry of blows. That means something to me. You're manipulating their spirit. You're essentially being Tai Li in sort of a chi blocker sort of thing. So what do you do with that? I would just go full blown into it. You don't just manipulate your enemy's key. You intertwine your soul with theirs. When you force them to make a dexterity saving throw, it's not because they're trying to avoid your attack. It's because you are literally mingling your soul with theirs and overpowering them, knocking them to the ground. Strength saving throw? You literally hit them so hard you can force their soul outside of their body and then their body has to go fly to catch up with it. Can't take reactions? Your soul's just more powerful. You have mingled with theirs and overcome it and they can't do anything about that until the next turn. Is that the same sort of concept as the open hand? Yeah, kind of, but you fully leaned into it. You've created flavor that cannot be ignored. When you use this ability, it's unique to your character. And you could do that with all the rest of those abilities. And if I were to go totally off type from the open hand, honestly, I'd go somewhere down the sorcerer's route. Maybe you've gotten powers from a dragon, but rather than get the fire breath or the ability to cast spells, you just got a dragon's strength. Pure, unbridled strength of a dragon that you're trying to figure out. Much like Iron Fist. That dexterity saving throw is because you're just punching that hard. When they fly away from you from that strength saving throw, it's because you hit them that hard. And Quivering Palm? I mean, you have the strength of a dragon. It might be a little ridiculous and kind of anime, but I would flavor it as something as you've hit this character so hard, so powerfully, that you temporarily broke the weave around them, and eventually that's going to catch up with them. But hopefully that gives a good example of how to create a unique character. The mechanics are there, yes, but the flavor doesn't have to be totally followed. The mechanics are important to your character. Every time you roll a dice, it's because of the mechanics. You can't avoid that. It will be a part of your character. But how you interpret how that looks, how that feels, what that means. Now that's different. A barbarian does not have to be angry. And I think people know that. But have people considered the fact that rage could be any multitude of things? A calm, tranquil state. A powerful, zen-like mode. Perhaps when you rage, it is just you trying for once, instead of just lazily moving your way through combat. Or how about a sorcerer? That magic that you're casting isn't really spell casting. Yes, the mechanics say it is, and you still have to follow the same rules, but maybe when you cast spells, it's literally you channeling the divinity of a god that doesn't really want to interact with things, and so it just decided, hey, ask me when you have a favor. On that level, it feels a lot more like a warlock, doesn't it? But it's still the mechanics of a sorcerer. Or let's say you're playing a bard, and you're quite literally a god who has imposed disadvantage on yourself by only being able to create certain things, sort of a test for yourself. Now, those are very roleplay heavy and have some pretty strong implications for your character, so you have to get the buy-in from your DM for that. And if they say no to it, hey, they say no. But I hope that gives an example of how to create a unique character. The mechanics are only just that, mechanics. They tell you how to get certain numbers on dice, and they tell you when to roll certain dice, and they tell you what the dice mean. But what that means for the story is totally up to you, and that's how you create a unique character. You take the expectations that are already there because you can't get around what the classes are, but you find a way to subvert that, to make it more interesting. Just recently, I really wanted to play a paladin that I didn't quite get the chance to, but I wanted them to be a witch doctor. Their smites were going to be just them channeling the demons that held within the certain abilities that they had, and they could channel that out in this sort of blinding black light. Still radiant damage, still smites. Not quite the same thing though, is it? Their lay on hands was also just going to be them using herbs and medicine that they had learned being a witch doctor. Their aura, literally a totem that they would carry around them and would create special powers for those in their party. None of that breaks the mechanics, that's just what the mechanics are but it was interesting. It subverted the expectation and it created a unique paladin. So please remember that the classes are just an archetype, a, a blank slate which you can add any amount of personality on top of. But if you do, you create a really memorable character. Hopefully that helps. Anyways, go out into the world and make it your own, you beautiful bastards. Don't forget to have a great day and never forget to play a role. Thank you. Come again.